Let's Google some art. Ugh. Hudson River School. Didn't go to images right away. Let's just, uh, always good stuff. What was the Hudson River School and why is it important? Is the Hudson River School an actual school? <laughs> no, it's not. It's a school. What was the focus of the Hudson River School? Uh, this is not supposed to be an encyclopedic kind of inquiry, but let's see. Outgrowth of the Romantic Movement. The Hudson River School was the first native school of painting in the United States. Strongly nationalistic, both in its proud celebration of the natural beauty of the American landscape and in the desire of its artists to become independent of European schools of painting. Interesting that kind of patriotic angle of them. So much we could click on here. Between 1825 and 1875, that should click with people for certain reasons. It's a non-actual school, right? But a group of artists. We're going to get a lot of repetition if we just keep going. Uh, over on the right here, Thomas Cole, Frederick Edwin Church, Asher Durand, Durand Asher Brown Durand, Albert Beardstadt. There's no clicky-click there, so they're listing four artists there. And I'm sure if we clicked, we could get further. Wikipedia. Here's a timeline <coughs> up here. I'll also, uh, what did I want to say? Romantic movement. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. In a way, but I, I disagree with that a little bit. It's true, I guess. Uh, and we even talked about romanticism in our, um, in the last video in terms of Van Gogh, uh, particularly Northern European art, North, Northern, well, yeah, I think specifically I said Eastern European art would be similar. It's those things that are departing from what we'd call Southern European art, meaning essentially Italianate art, of which we find like zero trace in the Hudson River School artists, that kind of classicism that is more rationalistic, balanced, harmony, idealized. And in that sense, yes, okay, we see the Hudson River School. Oh, nice. Try to enlarge this for you guys. We see the Hudson River School as tapping into this wildness emerging, randomness emerging that is important to its mission and important to this idea of creating an American art form, to appreciating the American wilds. This idea that there is something in the heart and the soul, I'm, I'm talking half paying attention here, oh, a me, a heed, Martin Johnson heed, that was important for the Hudson River School painters to, to, to capture as bringing European sensibilities, and I want to I want to qualify that as techniques. Beautiful paintings here, uh, not in the colonial period anymore. What happens if I click on some of these? Oh, this could be a whole journey in itself. This site, uh, Heart of the Andes, by um, uh, Frederick Church at the Metropolitan Museum, if I'm correct in all of this, in New York. And uh, we'll see That's how, how detailed this gets. So that image gets a little blurry at some point. Not quite as useful as, not quite the same technology as maybe if we had went to uh, Google Art and Culture pages. Um, but we can see techniques here that are um, maximized. This traditional European oil painting styles brought to America. And with that comes empathy. 
with that comes poetry profoundness that grabs our senses and pulls us in in a naturalistic, intuitive way, rather than an analytical, detached, conceptual way that we might look at images that are less naturalistic, uh, that are more expressive, personal, that need some kind of uh, translation in terms of artistry and brings in more our understanding of things first before we accept the imagery. And here, of course, this just pure eye power moving into the scene is a perfect natural window. Extension of our own world is, is the primary motivator here. Looks like a little smoke fire on the, the side of the mountain. Uh, or it could be a volcanic vent. I uh, don't know. And that empathy, that was new in American art at this point. It's representing the pure power of art to engage us fully, to capture our imaginations and try to fulfill the, the longings of our soul. The poetry, the kinds of responses that skill instills in us, where we're impressed, where we're really moved by the effort of the sensitive artist to give us the kinds of things that we aspire to, to fulfill our longings, to deliver beauty and transcendence from what we is seen around us. Hmm, that's not a bad way of putting it. Which is a romantic notion, I expect, and also a worthy notion, because I haven't talked much uh, in, in, you know, in that description about the artist themselves. And of course, they are the mechanism in this. They, they are the, the doers. <laughs> It is not overtly in order to express themselves visible in, in the message that they're giving. I want to disagree with all of that at some point. This is taking the, the, the uh, Hudson River as romantic artist. Let's go back because this is considered a beauty of technique and scale, vast, large painting. I don't have dimensions, didn't look like it gave it. But we see in early painting of the Hudson River School, its, it's first progenitor, founder, uh, Thomas Cole, early 1800s, 1820s, 30s, at the height of his power, his technique, giving us atmosphere, giving us really an expansive, vast view of the Oxbow in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Connecticut River. And there is a grandeur of scale here and a celebration of scenery and a celebration of not only the American wilderness, but of the country. Uh, and the way I, reason I'm being specific about it is because we do see wilderness here. Uh, we also see lots of cultivated land uh, down in the valley. The river, you know, a source of commerce, source of transportation, communication. All these things that do appeal to our senses, and I'll say our, our sense of well-being, comfort. Nice, we can zoom in on all that. Look at that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, all this is really beautifully done. And uh, a, a book of documents is what I'm guessing. With, with a flock of birds flying up from it. So we're going to get the resplendent, discreet kind of symbolism going on uh, rather than overt, right? You're going to say overt when we look at it, but mind you, uh, I'm talking in the greater realm of art and obviously different styles, different periods of art, things like symbolism would be much more blatant and put to the fore. You'd know there was symbolism long before you'd know that there's trees and um, whole complete scenes such as this cross umbrella birds these could be the accoutrements of an artist and we can see a boat of some sort on the river uh, a road coming down various 
uh, pedestrian activities going on. Like sheep in a field, if I know England, New England call those cows just as well. And this is the kind of thing that um, Cole would have approved of. Any of these, the, the painters of Hudson River School, there's another ship, small boat, uh, is pouring through this, these detail by detail. So who knows what, um, the derivation of all these are. Could have been any, any factual items, um, or it's, you know, that, that come with this observed realistic view of the world. This guy could paint, not always, but like I said, this is his kind of height of his achievement. I say not always, because I do think Cole is prone to, to cartoony, kind of harsh kind of coloring here and there throughout his career, and sort of maudlin, bordering on silly, you know, reaching for profoundness that's not there, themes in his work also. So here we do venture onto something that's, we'd call it, I'd call it surreal, this landscape that morphs into a huge kind of fountain or bowl of, of, of plenty. I'm just going to put my own label on it. Holy Grail? I don't know. That towers over the landscape. Now, he's not thinking that this is going to be surrealism, and surrealism isn't existing yet, but it goes along with the romantic ideas that we're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to play both sides of the coin here, so it's still going with romanticism. While reaching, you know, for something that's going to resonate more and spell out these ideas that we're just talking about and, and intuitively dredging up, intuitively reflecting on as we're seeing these previous works and now making them overt. It's an interesting kind of thing because he's bringing in classical elements and yet we don't get the sense that this painting is about classical themes. This is a reference to classical themes in kind of this romantic way. Uh, a culmination of Cole's romantic fantasies, this work echoes the artist's other works of the period, and it's Italian-derived scenery, an attempt to illustrate themes, grandeur of the past. I'm just going to leave it at that because it's confirming kind of what I'm saying one way or another. But I think it's important to point out that there is more going on here than just a feeling, emotional, you know, artistic activity of approach to the work because... Honestly, my sense of the Hudson River School, and I think I'm going to exit out of here. That was good. <laughs> I didn't even read that much. I'm sure there's lots we could read. My impression of Hudson River School is that it's not romantic. Maybe, maybe it derives there, but that it very quickly becomes more referential to enlightenment and rational kinds of movements and maybe that's natural evolution coming from Cole because he establishes the foundation and there's no you know the groundwork and there's no reason to repeat that for other artists and I'll just get this bigger because I know it's, it's good for me but not as good on your screen but as we go into, you know, move on from there, what we're looking at are artists such as, I don't want to dwell on this yet, and I hope I don't, but Bierstadt, P7, um, Brooklyn Museum in New York, uh, who mostly worked out west, so he's following the frontier, west meaning the Rocky Mountains, 
uh, and we can look into this scene in, in many of the similar ways that, that I talked about Cole. Uh, we can follow the light right into these paintings. And he's, uh, a, a, you know, a, a virtuoso, a tour de force of technique where we could take some of those ephemeral qualities that we talked about in the, the oxbow of Cole, vast open space, the delicateness of touch, the intangibility of the atmosphere, and see it even increased in Bierstadt. He comes after Cole. Cole's student, Frederick Church, who, who we saw there in the heart of the Andes, comes after Cole. That looks like a Bierstadt that's lighter. Plain air. Anniversary of the Hudson River School. There was nothing plain air about the Hudson River School, except they would go out and draw and do some studies from nature. These are all studio works. These are all major uh, ambitious works that are, owe as much to the you know processing translation through the imagination as they do from the notes that they were based on. A little blurry there, but that's a little more appealing image on the screen. Look at that, just, just ah, ah, solid gold. This is sunlit, you know, sparkling, kind of dewy, sensual. It embraces us. Church, what we have in church now in a openly stated way is something that's less romantic it's a romantic journey that brought him to places like the Andes Mountains, probably Ecuador here. But he's here more on scientific terms, partly driven by his techniques. And the reason I say that is because equal to the emotional engagement of the landscape for the viewer here are the pieces so it's not just the forest he's painting but the trees and if we could look carefully at any of the details that that church gives us we would identify plants we would identify flowers leaves different trees the geology and the ge actual geographic features cultural features also as we have a little village in the in the mid-ground of this piece. Uh, we have what looks like a little scene of, of missionaries in the foreground with a cross, and that looks like some kind of shrine. I'm not sure I see people there. Um, we may be able to make that out better. So I'll probably wrap it up after church here, even though it's just the slightest skimming of Hudson River School. The idea of details is by mastering nature. We master our destiny. And that was a much more modern and a much more European ideal as the 19th century went on. And we're just starting to dabble in the, the beginnings of the um, Industrial Revolution. Uh, and this idea of movement around the globe that inspired artists, philosophers, all kinds of realms of study as, as time wore on. You know, Church talked about his fascination with philosopher Heinrich von Humboldt and kind of the man seen as potentially alpha uh, ruler of, of the world. Get Niagara Falls here at the National Museum in Washington, D.C. Used to be where, uh, one of the places I taught, which was the Corcoran uh, Collection in Washington, D.C., uh, no longer in existence. We can see this attention to detail in, in, in everything that, that that church does. And this brings him to a very different place than his teacher, Cole. And why not? We all, we all rebel, right? We all try to bring something new to what's been given us before. But here's, here's a shore in Acadia National Park in Maine. View from the Catskills, which I visited a couple weeks ago, which is prompting this exploration here. And, uh, you know, I don't want to give the wrong impression. You're a very American painter, not always traveling, not always exploring. Parthenon, uh, actually a late work, 
um, a com very accomplished as he did have a, a definite decline as an artist and with his faculties, admittedly partly from um, arthritis that he was afflicted with in, in, in older age. Sensational, rationalistic, classical subject matter as, as well as treatment and very, very European in style. We don't see a lot of Hudson River painters working with architecture, uh, which did require different techniques and ways of working that were more understood in Europe. Uh, and Church absorbs that uh, and reflects it here in, in this piece. But we'll leave it with um, his view of the Andes after a storm, which is also one of his more renowned pieces and just a real eyeful. And I think we can contemplate a number of the issues that we've already talked about in a piece like this, where, wow, it's about Earth. It's about this place we find ourselves and this great wealth of land uh, that we're endowed with as human beings, particularly in the New World. It's about the power and the forces and the elements of nature in an almost godly religious way. It's also about the phenomenon and the scientific understanding of nature. I want to say the prism with through which we we see it, uh, and through which uh, it moves us, and we derive meaning, and it inspires in us this idea to understand it, to explore it, and to make it our own, or to live in peace and harmony with it to recognize it, uh, perhaps to grasp it as the, the crucible of creation and there, by extension, see it as our crucible of, of creation, our path, a destiny with a certain potential that we can move into, I'm just going to say, as we build into, into our future in this world. The downside of the Hudson River School was that as they get more particular, they become what was derogatorily talked about as, as leaf painters. <laughs> and it became easy for them, and this is probably a very imaginary scene, but it became easy for them in knowing the trees to, to build the forest or, or whatever came into their fancy, and eventually that would have become trite and a cliche. So ultimately, for all their ambition, the Hudson River painters moved on and gave way to what in America became tonalist painters, more the equivalent of what would have been the Barbizon school in Europe, and then American Impressionism, which would have shared uh, a lot of ideals of the Impressionist movement in Europe, of course, if not exactly the same spirit or, or subject matter. Oh, all the, all the choices and, and all the decisions, the design elements that we're faced with as artists, always reshuffling and in, in, intruding on what we're doing in any particular moment that applied to the Hudson River school of art as much as any other. So I'm going to leave it at that. And we can be more particular and detailed in our search some other time. But I hope you enjoyed this and thanks for tuning in. And we'll take one of those other journeys and follow those other stories another time. So I hope you'll join us again. See you then.